Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Reeves. If you're just joining us now, um, I'm, uh, I'm here as a moderator for today's talk, Face to Face. I'm a director at Sam Fogg, which is a London-based gallery devoted to the art of the Middle Ages. And I'm really excited to be able to welcome everyone joining us for what is the first in a series of events being held in the lead up to London Art Week Digital, which will run from the 3rd to the 10th of July. London Art Week Digital is a brand new London Art Week initiative developed in response to the ongoing global COVID-19 crisis. And along with its accompanying series of online talks and events, it aims to reach um, as broad and art loving public as possible, regardless of geography, and to more broadly reconsider how we can engage with art, imagery, and the aesthetic world around us when so many of us have been forced to sacrifice our normal relationship to it and the psychological benefits that it offers. For the time being, we are having to find new outlets for that impulse that we have as humans to experience art in the flesh, not just for contact with the artworks themselves, but also by extension with their makers, subjects, patrons, and collectors. How we do this from afar remains wide open to experimentation, as I'm sure many people um, attending this will have seen if they're engaging with the galleries participating with London Art Week and the museums who are trying to creep their doors open as we speak. But I don't think that it's mere coincidence that, the, um, that all three of today's panelists and myself as well have in recent months either conceived of or brought to fruition projects dedicated to the subject of today's conversation, which is portraiture. Given the enforced separation that many of us are still having to endure from objects held in museums, galleries, and other art organizations and repositories, it should perhaps come as no surprise that we're turning to the genre of portraiture in our desire for this very special form of human contact. In today's panel discussion, we will explore themes of identity, patronage, and the collecting history of historic portraiture. And it is important for us to note, of course, that we are um, operating in and um, considering a very thin slice of history with all of the limitations of perspective that that brings with it. And, and, and that our backgrounds bring with it. But without any further delay, I would like to introduce our spe three speakers today. Anne Van Camp is um, the Christopher Brown Assistant Keeper of Northern European Art at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, which she joined in 2015, following her work as curator of Dutch and Flemish prints and drawings at the British Museum in London. She has a long string of publications to her name, and has curated numerous exhibitions and displays, most recently Young Rembrandt, which I'm sure many of our attendees will have either seen or want to see, which is uh, unfortunately closed at the moment, but will, is slated to reopen in the autumn, I'm pleased to say. And it's a collaborative project between Ashmolean and the Museum de Lacajal in Leiden. Olivia Gosch was awarded the Anne Christofferson Fellowship in the Department of Prints and Drawings at the British Museum in 2017, after which she started working at Christie's as junior specialist in the old master painting department. And auctioneer, Olivia has overseen the conception and real realization of Christie's current online auction, FaceTime, devoted to portraiture from the 17th to the 20th centuries. Finally, last but not least, Andreas Pampelides. After working as the head of Christie's European sculpture department and as director at Colin Cortez Colnaghi Galleries, Andreas co-founded the commercial gallery Lulu Pampelides, which has become known for its flair for bold, ambitious displays and its wide-ranging interest in artworks spanning the medieval to the modern. For London Art Week Digital this year, Andreas is mounting an exhibition entitled In Silent Conversation, Portraits from the 16th to the 20th Centuries. I'm very pleased to be welcoming all three of you. I'm very grateful for your time this evening. And um, I think we should start. I'm going to start by trying as a technological Neanderthal to try and share my screen with everyone. So that everyone can see. I hope that that's coming through all right for everyone. Give me one second, I have to play. Right. 
with only short stuttering. I'm starting um, with you, Anne, because um, you provided me with some absolutely exquisite and I th really intimately um, conceived self-portraits, early self-portraits from um, Rembrandt's time when he was still working in Leiden, at, right at the beginning of his career. Um, and I thought I sh would open the discussion with you talking about what what portraiture allows us to do in in enabling us to look over the shoulder of the artist. I wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, I think that's a, a theme that really speaks to me, looking over the shoulder of the artist. And in fact, one of the sections in the exhibition is precisely titled that. And when I presented this concept to our exhibition team and the interpretation team and the marketing, marketing team at the Ashmolean, everyone got wildly excited about it. And so I'm really glad we'll be talking about this today. And so what I've shown you here on this first slide is in fact a sort of virtual reconstruction of the introduction wall of our exhibition, Young Rembrandt, which I'm blatantly going to plug a few times um, today. As you said, it closed um, after just a few weeks um, opening in Oxford, but we are hoping to reopen at some point in the not so far future. So please, if you haven't seen it, do um, travel to Oxford to come and see it. And so this introduction wall, is, it, it just almost makes me cry whenever I look at it because we really come face to face with the young Rembrandt. These are all self-portraits that Rembrandt made around 1628-1629 and they're done in the three different media that Rembrandt was working on. So we see a drawing um, on the left, a painting in the middle and a print and etching on the right. And so it's really the concept of the show, like we're looking over Rembrandt's shoulder, we're being confronted by him, by this young artist, and we're seeing what he's working on at the same time in these three different media. And that really allows us to explore him, to, to sort of get a glimpse into his workshop um, practices um, by looking across the three media in a more or less chronological way, we really get to see what this young artist is working on. And so here we're in 1628, 1629, it's roughly five years after Rembrandt set up as an independent artist in Leiden. So he's not that young anymore, like he's born in 1606. So if my maths are correct, he's now 22, 23 years old um, in this portrait. So he's not a, a very young artist, he's not a teenager no more, but he's clearly still quite hesitant, he's clearly still a bit insecure, he looks a bit moody, a bit melancholic um, in these portraits, and that's what I really love, and I think that's what many people draw to Rembrandt as well, is how we really um, get acquainted to him through these self-portraits. He, he made an astonishing number of self-portraits, I think 80 in total, of which almost half of them were prints, um, a handful um, were drawings and then the majority paintings. And so it's because we come face to face with this young artist that we've so grown to love him. And every year he seems to make new self-portraits. We literally see him growing up in front of us and developing not just as a person, but also as an artist. And to me, that's really fascinating. And that's something we, we really explored in the exhibition, how Rembrandt rapidly develops um, and then finally moved to Amsterdam, where he widens um, his circle of collectors um, and patrons. Um, maybe we should move to the next slide to sort of really see how Rembrandt engages um, with his sitters. And what I love about these, these are two of our absolute star works in, in the Ashmolean collection. On the left, we have a drawing a portrait drawing of his father and on the right um, a very delicate tiny um, etching of his mother uh, dated 1628 and sort of again I think that concept that you mentioned at the beginning Matthew of looking over the shoulder I think this is where we really see it this is where we see Rembrandt engaging at home still being in Leiden having returned to his parents house after his apprenticeships in in Amsterdam moving back home with his parents and just drawing, just sketching what he sees around him. And these two examples, the father and the mother, they're just the most tender mm -hmm. or examples of portraiture that I know is obviously you could argue as a young artist, he wouldn't have the means yet to, to employ professional models, but just the love that you can gather 
from these two portraits of his of his mother and his father. It's so palpable. It's it's just very very touching. Can I can I ask you a question on on because you you mentioned that actually of the the breakdown of his self portraits and I think of his work more generally, um, it's not painting dominated or or, or print dominated. Um, in entirety. This is actually a spread across all three media. He's, he's experimenting and potentially taking ideas from one across to the other and back again. And that's what we were really showing in Young Rembrandt is how already from the very first years of his career you see him working across the three media. And so that, although from an exhibition point of view, it's quite problematic to show prints and drawings alongside paintings because the paintings will inevitably sort of overwhelm the more delicate works on paper, but we were very careful in the design and the lighting of the exhibition to sort of make the works of works on paper stand their ground alongside the paintings. And that makes for a very interesting exhibition for an interesting narrative to see them alongside one another and really see Rembrandt developing to sort of get that glimpse into the workshop. This, um, these first two slides suggest an artist who is, um, is practicing on himself and on his family. But I think your third slide points out that actually he's turning the same very intimate gaze on a circle of friends, acquaintances and patrons potentially. Yeah. And so this is a much later work of art, so it's dated 1651. Um, and in fact, this is included in another Rembrandt um, exhibition that the Ashmolean has staged this year. And so this is currently in a touring exhibition called Rembrandt in Print, which is now in Hitchin and will later travel to Cork um, later this year. Um, and so this again, although it's much later, we're talking about more than, than, than 20 years later, it, it still expresses that same intimacy. This is a portrait of Clément de Jonge, who was a print seller and art dealer in Amsterdam. Um, he's 30 years younger than Rembrandt, but we know that they struck up this really strong friendship because of him being a print seller and him um, collecting Rembrandt's works of art as well. We know, in fact, that Clément de Jonge acquired some of Rembrandt's copper plates when Rembrandt was in financial trouble and Rembrandt's copper plates were so personal to him that it, it, it says a lot about that friendship that he sort of trusted Clément de Jonge with the care of his copper plates for them to be um, reprinted again and that really shows in this portrait. It's, for me it's one of the most touching portrait prints that, that Rembrandt ever made and as you can tell Clément de Jonge is very comfortable. It's like he's just walked into Rembrandt's studio plunked himself into this big armchair, hasn't even taken the time to take his coat off, his hat off, his gloves mm -hmm. off. He's just sort of sitting there, leaning back, catching up with his friend. And Rembrandt probably sort of, as spur of the moment, started to make a portrait of his friend. And it's just so tender and I absolutely love it. And we know that Rembrandt took great care of this portrait because although it looks very informal, it looks very quick, spontaneous, in fact, there are five different states of this print in which Rembrandt was simply retouching the facial features um, of Clément de Jonge. They're very subtle retouchings, very subtle edits, but it, it sort of supports um, this notion that he wanted to get his, his, his friend's um, features absolutely right in this portrait print. Um, so the fascination with collecting portraits um, obviously didn't begin in Rembrandt's time, um, but here we see this relationship emerging. And I'd just like to touch on another image that you've given me very kindly, while discussions I, I believe are still in play surrounding the acquisition of this painting by the Ashmolean Museum. But this is, um, this is contemporary collecting of historic portraiture. And so um, we have some, we, we, we have not had any idea, in fact, of who this lady might be until today, you suggested, I think. Yes, yeah, so this is very exciting for me to present it, and I did clear it with our development department, if I could talk um, about this um, acquisition that we're trying um, to uh, receive for, for the Ashmolean Museum. So this is a, a painting by a very young Anthony van Dyck, and it's dated around 1619, van Dyck born in 15. 
1999, so roughly the same age as, as Rembrandt from the self-portrait we just saw a few slides earlier. And so it's um, a portrait of a young woman, 1619, Van Dyck is still living in Antwerp in his hometown before he moves to England and eventually travels to, to Italy. Um, so a subject close to my heart of Antwerp, as you know, um, is also my hometown. And so what is interesting about this portrait, I think, is that although up until now we didn't know who the sitter was, is that the format is a full length, which is very unusual for Van Dyck in his Antwerp period to sort of depict um, wealthy um, patrician uh, people um, in a full length. Normally they were half length, three quarters length, and he would reserve the full length for royal portraits or, or, or noble um, aristocrat portraits. And so um, during my research for, for the acquisition of this portrait, I might have found who is the lady. There was always sort of a question mark, is this Mrs. Mrs. Fink? But no one really knew who Mrs. Fink was. Um, and then there's a pen uh, to this portrait in, in the Antwerp Museum of her husband. So it's a wedding uh, portrait of Mr. Fink. And so we know there's only two Mr. Finks in Antwerp at that time, and it's Alexander and Jan Fink. And so this had been um, identified in an exhibition about Van Dyck portraiture in the Frick collection, I think five years ago now. Um, and so Alexander Fink had been established as um, the sitter of the male portrait. And so I started looking into, well, who was his wife then? If, if we know Alexander Fink is the male pendant, who's the female pendant? And so I've now found from old auction catalogs, old archival documents, which I have to find online because I don't have access to libraries or, or archives at the moment, that this might then be his wife who's called Kertra Wichers. And so I'm just waiting now for um, the Belgian churches to be allowed to reopen again so I can send my dad in to take a photo of a stained glass window which supposedly features this wife of Alexander Fink of Fiatra Rivers to make the complete positive match of this lady um, as Fiatra Rivers. But yeah, we're currently trying to, to acquire this portrait and it would be a great addition to the Ashmolean's collection, I think. Is there any suggestion in her dress that um, she is connected to the silk industry? Well, this is interesting. So we know that Alexander Fink was a wealthy silk merchant. Um, we know Van Dyck was born in that milieu, like his father was a very wealthy textile merchant as well. And so this sort of, this could be a clue in the answer. Why did Van Dyck represent her in full length? Why didn't mm. he just do a half length or a three quarter length for these wedding portraits? So maybe they were close friends because the Vinks and the Vickers are not known as great art collectors. They're not known as great art patrons. So why would Van Dyck make an exception just for them? And in fact, I only know of one other painting that Van Dyck painted of a full length female figure in his Antwerp period. And that's of Susanna Fourmont. And um, you may remember that Susanna Fromont is the sister of Helena Fromont, who would become Rubens's second wife after his first wife, Isabella Brandeis. But that's much later, of course. But in fact, the Fromonts were already in-laws of Rubens's first wife um, because um, they were married to the brother of his first wife. And so there's, there are these really close family friendship connections with Rubens. And so it's very likely that Rubens was introduced to Susanna Fromont by his great um, teacher and whose major assistant he was Rubens. So perhaps these close connections led Van Dyck to paint normal patrician people in full length. Okay. So it's a, this is a society portrait of a female sitter potentially a female patron um, and this moves us I think quite nicely onto Olivia's um, first image um, which is this rather um, it, it's it, it's got a, an amazing looseness and yet it all comes together in the face doesn't it of this portrait of Nora Lindsay the celebrated garden designer yeah, so there's actually a second link here because this was also painted on the occasion of her marriage. Um, so we've got two marriage portraits here, actually. Um, she married uh, Sir Harry Lindsay. Um, and so in a sense, what we're looking at here is a very personal portrait, as, as with the Van Dyck. 
these would have been things that hung on their walls. Um, mm. and, and yet with lots of these society portraits, I think the thing that we sort of forget about them is that they're, they're charged both in the personal sense um, and then in a sort of broader um, social sense because um, so Nora Lindsay was linked through her husband to Violet Manners, the Duchess of Rutland, who was one of the big sort of, she was an artist in her own right and a sculptress, but she was also connected to the Souls, which was a group in London at this time who were very apolitical. They're against Gladstone's idea of home rule and they wanted to not have to talk about politics when they went out in, in public. So they had these salons where they were talking sort of the idea of art for art's sake. So on one side here, you have a portrait that is situated very much in the idea of just looking at the beauty within a woman and the love that she would share with her husband. And, but the apolitical is also seen here as being, in a sense, we can see it as political because it's the same idea of high Victoriana where the woman becomes a sort of delicate being. She's a possession of her husband in the same way that her husband would have possessed the portrait. Mm. Um, so, I do it, think, sorry. Sorry, no, no, I was just, it, it's interesting thinking about um, um, the capacities of women at this date for self-expression. And um, she, she did so through her garden designs. But she mainly became famous for her garden designs after her marriage collapses. Right. So it's after her marriage collapses that she really does become um, much more important to the garden design because it's something that she turns to. Okay. So there is this, with, in this figure, there's a, a very complex link between the female sitter, the male artist, um, how society would have viewed her as a bride, how society would later view her as an artist. And I think these are all things that we have to think about when we talk about portraiture because we have to remember that it's a, a three-way contract in a sense between the artist, the sitter and the viewer. Absolutely. Obviously, we have to approach them as the viewer. Um, and the artist is trying to please the sitter, but at the same time, trying to please a greater public. In this sense, what's his public? We are looking here at the sort of, the high, yeah, as I said, a high Victoriana. Mm. And you get, I mean, here, the idea of sort of the white and the purity, it's, it's natural, it's this, this beauty that the, the, of the English rose almost. And that in itself is a very political image because lots of it, I think there has been this idea throughout, especially British portraiture, which we see sort of growing very sharply in the 18th century and coming through all the way up until the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, where we, we I am British, so I'm gonna say we, positioned, often they position themselves in comparison, for instance, with the French. So the idea in England was that French portraiture was very artificial. And in English portraiture, we have this naturalness, which we've got here in the looseness of the brush strokes and the pallor of her skin. She's not wearing a lot of makeup. So that in itself, we've got the English naturalness as opposed mm -hmm. to the French artificiality in this. So that again, in all style choices that an artist makes, as well as pleasing the sitter, he's pleasing a wider audience. I'd like to pick up on what you said about that contract because it's something I wrote down before we started talking, it's this three-way, this tripartite conversation, but also the lens of manipulation, of presentation and uh, function that you pick up on with this incredibly bombastic portrait of Frederick, Duke of York. Yes. So this one here, this is actually a miniature. I know it's all very, it's always very odd to see art on a screen because you don't get the sense of dimension or scale that you'd usually hope to get. So this miniature is appearing to me just as large as Van Dyke's full length, which is incorrect. <laughs> um, but so this actually relates to a full length portrait painted by Thomas Lawrence in 1816, which was intended for the Waterloo Chamber at Windsor Castle. So the original idea for this portrait was to show all of the social um, and military power that you have. So Frederick, Duke of York, most of you might know him as being the grand old Duke of York who had 10,000 men. And that is definitely not the image of himself that he's trying to portray in this. The original one was looking at him, he's got his field marshal's robes, he's got his marshal's baton, he's got the order of the garter. 
And the whole point of the Waterloo Chamber was that it showed the heroes of Waterloo and of the Napoleonic Wars and heads of state would have to walk through that to get to an audience chamber. And that was incredibly important for royal um, image because obviously fighting against Napoleon is fighting against the anti-monarchical push that happened in Europe up to that point and it's showing through the portraits and the, as a symbol of power that that has been swept aside and now you just walk down this row of enormous swagger portraits to a certain extent. But here, what Fred, so these were actually commissioned by Frederick and so he's subverting the idea of this state portrait bringing it down on a much smaller scale and using this as how he wants to present his personal image. These are small portraits that he would hand out. So it's interesting to see that even, on his, in, even in his personal life, he wants to be perceived as the public persona. And it's this backwards and forwards you've got here, which is very interesting in this sense to think about when you think of social contracts. Um, thinking about uh, private and public personas, I'd like to move on to an image that ties you and Andreas together, in fact. Um, quite interestingly, this Brunelleschi self-portrait um, from 1920. Of course, this, this fantastic um, uh, uh, theatre designer, illustrator, um, artistic director of popular magazines or artistic magazines in um, Paris, I, I, he is presenting himself in a very particular way here, isn't he? Yes, and obviously here, what you've, because this is a self-portrait, you've cut out the idea of the city. Rather than having a triangle, we've now got the artist and the viewer. In all of these situations, we should never assume that a portrait is an objective thing. This is an incredibly subjective view that you're looking at. Um, but here you've got, yes, various different things he's playing with. In a sense, the fact that he's got, you've got the black coming down here with just the head, which really stands out against these very rich blacks. That's playing with, in a sense, sort of almost like looking at the antique, the way you might view a Roman head and an emperor. He's got this power that he's looking straight out at the viewer. And then you've got the mask. So he was really interested in the Commedia dell'arte and Venetian art of the 18th century. So you can see it pulling through from that, but also, is he asking us a question? He's saying, is this my face? I'm actually, is this a mask that I put on to show you? And this is, and then with the puppet in the background, often you see, is he the person who, are, as the viewer, are we meant to see ourselves as the puppet? Is he manipulating us through this image? Is it a challenge? You're, it's, it's a conversation, in a sense, he's giving us three options in this one self-portrait of how we can understand it or how we can approach it. It's really challenging, but it's, then it's got these fantastic colors. So you're just, you're drawn to the colors. And then you start to think about how we see this conversation. In a sense, it's going back to what Anne said about looking over the shoulder of the artist, like here, which is the shoulder we should look over? Where, how should we approach it? I think it's yeah, absolutely fascinating in terms of thinking of portraits as conversation. And there are, there are degrees of passivity here, aren't there? These, these various masks, and of course, self-portraiture is a, also a kind of mask, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, in the same way that I put on makeup this morning, that's my mask that I present to the world. Here, Brunelleschi has used the paint. The paint is his makeup. He's painted it onto the, onto the panel, and that is the mm. face he's chosen to show the world. Andreas, I wondered if you would speak to this as well, because I know that you have a quite a, a direct insight into this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a painting that um, that I own, and in fact, um, I entrusted Chrissy's to actually take responsibility for selling it for me, and uh, and it's a painting that normally lives on that wall right over there, and it's something that I had an an instant connection with. I mean, and I think that's. It's the way I responded to it. I mean, Olivia, I completely agree. I love all these different layers of the masks. I mean, in my sense, I was attracted to the beauty of the man himself, but also this sort of very deeply psychological, slightly mm, egotistical impression he wants to give. And in a way, I ended up having multiple conversations with him, depending on the day that I was looking at him. Um, so you can really play with it on so many different levels, and I think it speaks to different people in different ways. But um, yeah, I'll be I'll be sorry if uh, if it does sell, and I'll be sorry if it doesn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about um, uh, thinking about how how 
portraiture interacts with theatre, um, mm. uh, mythology and play, I would like to move on to one of your um, portraits. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, in this, by coincidence more than anything, in the Brunelleschi and, and the next image, which is this uh, study of um, the daughter of Iorio, a man called Eligi, there is an important theatrical connection. I mean, Brunelleschi was a, a painter and a decorator of um, theatre stages, ballet stages. And, uh, and this particular portrait by Michetti, who was a Southern Italian painter from actually from the region in uh, Abruzzo, um, he was one day in the 1880s with his friend and uh, companion, um, Gabriele D'Annunzio, the sort of very controversial Italian poet and playwright. And the two of them are standing on this uh, village square one day and they see this incredible scene of a very attractive, confident woman walking through the town square and a group of men jeering at her and, and throwing abuse at her. And one man, which is the man that we see in this drawing, completely bewitched by her. Uh, so what we're looking at here is actually the study of the head of this particular man, which is an excerpt from a five meter wide canvas in, um, in um, I forget which museum it is now, but in Pescara, in the uh, government palace in Pescara. And uh, what this really tells us is um, a lot about the culture of a very poor part of Italy at the end of the 19th century, where you have this, this an observation of um, the peasant folk of, of the region at the time. They're arguably very sort of insular, uh, myopic view of the place of women in society. I mean, Michetti was really interested in the study of people at the time and how they were infected by their environment. So in this case, the beautiful woman. I, I wish I could show you an image of the whole painting because it, it doesn't quite make sense just seeing the portrait of, of this one man. But what you have is in fact um, five men lying on a mountainside. They've actually replaced the town square with, uh, with the mountainscape. And this incredibly beautiful woman in a red cloak walking with confidence through this landscape. And the men are jeering and hurling abuse. And you just have this one guy, Eligi, staring at her, looking at completely transfixed and putting aside all of the small town, you know, village mentality of, uh, you know, she's wearing a red cloak. She must be, uh, you know, a woman of ill repute. Um, so what we're looking at here is the love a man can feel for a woman, despite all of these um, awful preconceptions that existed at the time. Um, but side. also, yeah. yeah, but also in looking at the face of the man, it, you know, extracted from the context of the painting, you're looking at a study of, you know, a noble person, someone who's been sort of beaten by the sun, someone who, you know, Michetti obviously had an attraction to him. Um, you know, he's painted him very sort of romantically, very beautifully. There's a huge amount of attention to the, you know, the treatment of the, the structure of the face and the eyes. Um, it's, it's something that was executed at the end of the 19th century, but I mean, I think it speaks to us today as much as it would have done at the time. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a really powerful thing. And, and in fact, just to sort of close the loop on the theatrical aspect, D'Annunzio went and wrote a play based on this particular encounter between Aligi, the man in the drawing here, and the woman um, that he fell in love with. And it went on to become a very important play, one of the most famous that he wrote. So this is incredible balance between, you know, the painter, the dramatist, and, uh, and this drawing that we have here in front of us, and our experience of it as well. Um, so far, we have looked um, entirely at two-dimensional imagery but actually, Andreas, one of the most enigmatic portraits mm. that um, I have come across in us talking about this um, event is, is this portrait of a bearded man that you gave me. Yeah. And I, it, it's extraordinarily en enigmatic. There's, a, there's a, an, an amazing um, degree of refinement in and, and verism in things like the... Um, uh, the pop marks in, uh, around the bags of his eyes, the vein on mm. his forehead. But mm. do we know who he was? How, what is our relationship supposed to be to him? Yeah, uh, and, and this is the, 
depressing but also fascinating thing about working in this field because quite often we're presented with objects today without a context so we know very little about who the person was or who might have made them and it's really a process of narrowing down what we're looking at um, that we actually get to hopefully an answer and in this case um, we're looking at a, a portrait of man we don't know who I mean we can make assumptions of who he was based on the type of hair he had the beard I mean he may have been some sort of um, um, a jurist or possibly a philosopher. I mean, it's very much, um, he's represented in the way that ancient philosophers were represented in, in Greek and Roman portraiture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there was, an, there was a moment when, when I first started researching the bus that I considered the possibility of it, in fact, being ancient. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, when you see, you see up front and uh, see the detail and, and the way that it's been carved, you, you have to exclude that possibility. But what's particularly impressive about it, and again, you can't really appreciate it on a, on a screen, um, is that in fact, it's, it's incredibly subtle. And the artist has gone for a, what I call a warts and all approach in the way that he represented the sitter. This was obviously not a man, the sitter that is, that was particularly um, interested in being idealized. And, and in the mid 16th century um, Roman portraiture, it, it was very typical to present the best of yourself. Um, so we have to consider the possibility that either it was made posthumously or that it was made with the sitter's um, explicit understanding of what the portrait would look like. And you really have everything here, you know, the little dimple on his baggy mm -hmm. eye, the, the mm -hmm. throbbing temple. What you can't see in this photo is that he's gone to great trouble to render the, you know, the, the musculature in the, in the throat and the wrinkles in the back of the neck. I mean, it's a very, very strong thing, which, again, out of its context, you know, has an incredible modernity to it. I mean, it, 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 you know, it is a 16th century portrait, which looks like an ancient portrait, which could have been carved almost, you know, today, you know, it's got that immediacy, which I think speaks to a lot of people today. Um, I think the fact that it's so pure and the white marble and doesn't have the sort of fussiness of a, of a torso, which it presumably would have originally been set into, you have something that's very sort of, you know, out there. Thinking about how you present yourself to the public, I would like to move on to the last mm. page of today's talk, again from you, mm -hmm. Andreas, of yeah. the poetess Fanny Tedeschi in, in full uh, oration mode, it would seem. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as you'll probably see, she's actually right behind me um, in, on the screen. The perfect and, uh, London Art Week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I, as I explained to the other panelists earlier on today, I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, the best way to communicate your well, one's passion for art is, you know, to have a real intimate connection to it. And, and in my case, you know, I, I happen to have the temporary privilege of being able to live with her. Um, whereas, of course, Anne and Olivia have different um, ownership of the pieces that they, they live and work with. Um, in this case, this is something that I bought um, about a year and a half ago. And it's a, it's a painting that speaks to me in, in, on many different levels as well, because it's, um, it's a portrait by an artist called Gino Parin. He's not at all known outside of Italy. Um, and it's a portrait of his muse, uh, his lover, a woman called Fanny Tedeschi. Um, it was painted in around 1926. And it's a painting that I hope could speak to people today because it's a noble portrait. It's very dignified. Here you see her in full oration mode. Um, it was painted the year before she died. Um, and he painted her hundreds of times over his career. Um, and this is perhaps the most sort of abstract of, of all the portraits that he did. Um, Perrin was um, from uh, Trieste in Northern Italy, but actually moved to Munich and spent a lot of time in Vienna at the, in, the mid in the mid 20s, 1920s. So he was familiar with people like Franz von Stuck, he knew Gustav um, Klimt, Ferdinand Knopf. So he was very much in the you know, secessionist movement. And you can see that in the way that he's painted these very sort of abstract, very bold colors, um, the, the outfit that she's wearing. But you see the, the black halo around her, this sort of cloak, which is billowing in the wind and these white clouds, which almost look like, I, mean, I call them clouds, but they could easily be lightning. I think they, 
anticipate something much more um, um, dark, which is the fact that both Fanny and Gina were Jewish uh, artists living in Italy in the 20s. Mm. I mean, Gino himself died in Bergen-Belsen, it's in a concentration camp in 44. And uh, even though he was from a, a German speaking Italian family and he had a sweet, uh, Swiss passport, he ultimately did suffer at the hands of the Nazis. And I think this tells us a lot about, you know, this ill-fated love between painter and muse. It can tell us a lot about ourselves looking at it today and understanding in the current socio-political climate, you know, I don't think I need to spell it out too much, um, you know, identity, you know, but putting all those very meaningful and profound um, subjects aside, I, I look at this and I, again, have conversations with, with both artists. I think this is something that, you know, you, it can catch you off, off, off the moment and you think, oh my God, you know, what was she thinking at that point? You know, is she anticipating something? Is she, what is she thinking? It's a very austere, but delicate and passionate gaze that she has and the way that the artist himself has interpreted her. I think so it speaks on many different levels. Sorry there, Andreas. Um, no we've, we've been looking at a, a very small selection of really remarkable portraits from a 400 year period. Um, no more than that, really. And um, something that struck me in conversation with you all and through thinking about these portraits is that, um, and, and what is coming up again and again, is this very subtle underlying union that, that there is a dichotomy in portraiture, that, that we are drawn to it because of its apparent intimacy, its, its perceived glimpse over the artist's shoulder at a at a moment that uh, apparently only they are witnessing but at the same time there is this there is this act there is a mask or there is a um, a facade that's been constructed for us to see as well and and i know that you have thoughts on this idea of, of rembrandt acting acting up to the canvas or to the etching plate yeah exactly especially in the self-portraits you can really there's so many different expressions. The three I've shown at the beginning are sort of um, expressing the same mood, sort of very dark, gloomy, introvert mood. Um, but there's many, to this. Yeah, let's go back to you. that slide. Yeah. But for instance, if you look at the one on the left, the drawing, it's one of the most stunning drawings, I think, made in brush, very quickly made, but so skillfully. You know, he painted it with the tip of the brush and to get all that detail in. Um, casting himself um, in shadow on one side. Um, but if you look very closely, although it appears very spontaneous, it appears very intimate, you see that his lips are parted. Um, he's sort of opening his mouth. And I always sort of wonder, is he, is he talking to us? Is he just a bit tired? I don't know. But so it's not a very spontaneous pose, because if you're going to paint yourself or draw yourself or etch yourself, you're not going to do it with your mouth open. You're usually sort of going to close your mouth and be in a more relaxed pose. So it's not as spontaneous as we think. And I think Rembrandt is really acting up in, in front of his mirror in his workshop. And a lot of the self-portraits, especially these early ones, is trying out different modes of expressions, different facial expressions. And in fact, this sort of touches on the concept of why did Rembrandt make so many self-portraits? Were they immediately for the market? Um, but rather these early sort of expressive portraits, they're more for his personal use. And we then see that he reuses these facial expressions in other works of art. So you see exactly this, the same face we see in the drawing. We see in another print by Rembrandt, which is in the show, a self-portrait made around the same time, like much, much smaller, barely the size of a, of a postage stamp. And then that face is reused in another etching by Rembrandt in which he presents himself or dresses himself up as an actor, showing himself as a beggar. And how unusual is that for, for a sort of self-respecting artist who is still trying to find his way at the very beginning of his career, he's still trying to find his market, his patron, to show himself as a beggar rather than as an aristocrat to sort of align himself with the rich commissions he's seeking. And so I find that really fascinating that Rembrandt sort of brings himself down and then plunks these self-portraits that he made earlier 
onto a beggar figure. And he seems to do that throughout his career, doesn't he? That he's that there are moments when his self-portraits are very pompous or aspirational, and others when they're incredibly humble. Yeah. And, and in some cases, almost humiliated. He is. Yeah. He's, Absolutely. Been put down by life. Yeah. And so he comes from a working class background. His father was a mold miller in Leiden, quite a wealthy mold miller. So maybe Rembrandt is just sort of toying with that idea of coming from a working class background. But we also need to look at these uh, beggar self portraits in the context of his time. Um, there's, of course, a lot of religious persecutions going on in the Netherlands, there's mass migrations. Um, of Protestant people who lived in the south who are being pushed north to the more tolerant um, newly founded Dutch Republic. So there is a lot of homelessness, there are, there are a lot of beggars seen in the streets of Leiden and so it's also a reflection of the historical background at the time. Can but yeah, you're right. a question when... about his um, self-portraits? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if it's allowed. Please, to Olivia, yes, of course. <laughs> um, I know that in lots of his um, etchings you get that the, in the different states you see a lot of changes so like Ekioma with the and you get the sort of cavern at the bottom or the figure that looks a bit like Neptune and you see him playing with the same image and putting details in and taking them out do you see the same thing when you're looking at self-portraits in the different states do you see him playing with different facets of light or things like that so that they're more considered than immediate yeah they're sort of quite subtle the same sort of with the Clement de Yonne. Um, portrait in which there's five different states, but you really have to look very carefully to sort of distinguish the states. It's the same with the self-portraits, but you're right, it's usually adding more shade, adding more cross-hatching, and so you can sort of slowly see him obscuring his face more and more. And I love these portraits because you sort of start peering into them or looking at them with a the magnifying glass and more and more details appear the longer you look at it. So slowly, although it looks like a half a face half cast in shadow all of a sudden you see his eye peering out um but yeah so he's clearly working on them he's really elaborating on this time they're often yeah they're literally that size some of them and he, he clearly works a long time on them that's really interesting i wondered if we could bring andreas in here because um if uh, people would like to, they are able to ask questions while we still have our esteemed panellists with us. Um, we have a question from Nicholas Cranfield. Thank you, Nicholas, of um, how we know or why um, did D'Annunzio wait 20 years to write his play after the encounter with Aligi? Mm. Uh, well, I don't know for sure. I mean, I know that the play, The Daughter of Yore, was a work in progress and took many years for Danuncia to, to refine. Um, but but beyond that, I'm not I'm not really sure. Sorry. Sorry, Nicholas. We'll do some more research <laughs> on that one and get back to you. Um, Miles Cater, you brought up a um, uh, the elephant that's forever in the room of the art market today, which is um, has the record sale with so much associated publicity of Leonardo's Salvatore Mundi had any noticeable effect on the portraiture market. Um, I wondered if any of our panelists would like to tackle that one. Do you want me to go first as a Christie's person? Please, Olivia. It's, that's an interesting question because we do have to ask ourselves first, do we see the Salvatore Mundi as a portrait? And the question of what is portraiture is an enormous one. We think about, is it just likeness? How do we know what Jesus looked like? Then it wouldn't be a portrait. If it's the idea of capturing the sort of essence of someone, <laughs> having stood in the room with the Leonardo, that did have a, a really magical presence actually in the same way that his paintings and his drawings always do. The, anyone who was lucky enough to go and see the show at the Louvre recently will have realized that. Um, I think what you see often in the art market is that there is an idea of there's a masterpiece market, which the Leonardo definitely falls into, um, and that's not really affected by fashion or trends. If we're thinking about why people are attracted to portraiture and collecting, that's, oh, and collecting portraiture, sorry, that's a very interesting one. I think portraiture has sort of two levels to it. Um, one of them, which is something that um, Panofsky spoke about 
is the idea that in all of portraiture, there's a connection, you're trying to capture how the sitter is connected to the rest of humanity. And you think about that um, in portraiture where people want to have portraits of their family, going right back, sort of when you, in the Renaissance, you start seeing people not only painting portraits of living people, but ancestors who have died and you're collecting it that way. So it's to do with our connection to the world around us. And then, so as well as the kind of universal um, element, you've got the individual elements, and those are the markers of what sets that person apart. Um, so with Fanny Tedeschi, you've got the power of the oration, or with um, um, the Duke of York, you do have the very specific physical markers of like the star, the chain of the Order of the Garter. And I think one of the reasons that portrait is perennially popular as a collecting subject is that you, on a sort of primal level, we react to the connection that we can immediately have as people, as humanity. And then on a more personal level, you might react to the fact that somebody did work in the theatre and you love the theatre, or you come from Antwerp and the person who painted it is from Antwerp. So it's us picking up on both the universality of being human and also the individual things that situate who we are in the world. And that's something that's true for everybody across time and across all societies, actually. So I think that's the reason why portraiture is itself such a, such a popular um, collection area. Um, but to go from that to whether or not the Leonardo um, had an effect on the portraiture market is a, a leap that I don't think I'm qualified to make. I thought you answered that really beautifully though. That was fantastic and um, really summed up everything that we've been trying to uh, tease out from this uh, event, I think, as well. Um, I would like to um, let the participants get to their much deserved gin and tonic now. So I will um, draw a close to this um, event and thank everybody for attending, participating and for the questions. And I hope that, um, uh, firstly, I've got to thank the participants. So thank you all um, for joining us. And I'd just like to um, remind the participants that we have, the attendees while they are still with us, that there will be another London Art Week digital um, online talk um, moderated by Anna Brady on the 27th of June at 11 a.m. And it's, the subject is Collecting Pre-Contemporary Art Online. I hope that you can join us for it. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Again, thank you all, and um, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew.